Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming back. I want to talk now about what is essentially something that's at the heart of what I've been discussing earlier, coercion. Because essentially what has been talked about in the psychological uh, sense is applying coercion to troops in the field. As I said, the dead have no vote. It's how you persuade those that are still alive to do what you want that is the art of generalship. So coercion is just a word that covers what you do to people in the army, in the field, right up to what you do to Slobodan Milosevic at the time of the Kosovo operation. You coerce them. You persuade them to do something. But I suppose the question is then, how do you do that? And this, it seems to me, is you will take it that you are the emperor, the king, the prime minister, whatever it is. Uh, so you have lots and lots of power. The question is, how do you persuade your enemy, your friends, your allies, whoever it is, to achieve that sort of political outcome? How do you, what sort of mechanism do you use to achieve that outcome? Uh, it won't be any surprise to you to know that lots of strategists have grasped at this thing uh, a lot of them have failed to produce a theory that works. Some of those who have actually tried it and succeeded don't know why it's occurred, uh, but most have been obsessed with their own theories and have blamed everybody else when the theories don't work. But I'm going to suggest to you that actually this is all about psychology. But it's a rather different sort of psychology in the sense that it's unlike military psychology because there are more instruments available to you. So what I'm going to talk about is how the state uses its instruments. It's not just about the size of the army, the nuclear threat, the everything else. It's more about what are the instruments that you can use and how do you use them. I, now, conventionally, people tend to think of this as being something to do with nuclear theology. How do you use nuclear weapons to persuade people? How do you use your massive, overwhelming power to persuade people? But I'm going to surprise you now because actually the most classic and one that's been around for at least 10,000 years and probably even beyond the last ice age, this is power. <laughs> this is Louise de Kerouac. Louise de Kerouac was born in uh, Britain. Uh, she was born to an aristocratic family that were going nowhere. She was born in the 1650s. She ended up at the court of Louis XIV, and he thought she looked quite pretty. This is a painting of her that currently hangs, at, uh, uh, hangs in Maddingley at Cambridge. And i uh, just point out, uh, you probably can't see it, it says, of Portsmouth. Well, I'll come on to that in a minute. So there she is. She's a painting, and she's obviously left breast revealed with a pigeon. I don't, I don't know the full messages that are being conveyed by having a pigeon and a left breast revealed, but just take it that there are messages <laughs> there. She arrived at the court of Louis XIV, and he quite liked her. But he thought, I know somebody who will like her even more, and that was Charles II. So when Charles II's sister, uh, who was Henrietta, known as Minette, she was the Duchess of Orléans, went back to visit Charles II in 1670, who should go with her as part of her retinue but Louise de Kerouac? So Louise de Kerouac arrives in the court in London as part of the retinue of Charles' sister. She was very clever. This is this lady. She was very clever. She was known to be strong-willed. She was obviously pretty. Uh, she had that sort of vulnerable type of um, uh, demeanor, uh, sort of characteristics. But uh, everybody thought that she was um, somebody who was very attractive and very charismatic. Nell Gwynne, who you recall was Charles II's mistress at the time, called her Squintabella. And because she was also Louise de Kerouai, she became known as Crybaby. But whatever her success is, by 1671, i.e. one year after she arrived uh, in London, uh, she became Charles's official mistress. He then showered her with gifts, Nell Gwynne was kicked out, and one year later she gave birth to a bastard son known as Charles, who then became Duke of Richmond. A year after that, Charles created her Duchess of Portsmouth, and it's a Duchess you can't see, so she's now Duchess of Portsmouth, and he wrote to Louis XIV saying, this great girl you've sent me, she should be created Duchess in France. And so Louis XIV created a Duchess of Aubigny. And she lived with Charles all the way through the rest of his life. But she was all the time in the pay of Louis XIV. She did what Louis wanted, and she persuaded Charles to do what was required. Charles, as you probably recall, was an Anglican. He was persuaded on his deathbed to become a Catholic. 
He was persuaded to change the laws of Britain so that his, his brother, James II, who was a Catholic, could inherit uh, the kingdom. Uh, and all the laws that uh, differentiated, discriminated against Catholics, where well, most of them were put, uh, put to naught, uh, and they were allowed to proceed. Charles even borrowed money off Louis XIV at suitable terms in order to uh, finance his, his exploits. So this is a lady who had immense amounts of power. And she could, with a little cry and a little squint and a little popishness, control the destiny of a nation. And she was doing it on behalf of a foreign power. Now Charles almost certainly knew this, but he didn't care. So, ladies and gentlemen, we talk about power. Let's not forget that this is probably one of the most important ones. So, when we talk about power, let's just talk about these sorts of things. Uh, what sort of power is this? Well, we think we all know uh, what sort of power this with is. This is a, this represents power in a world which is different. You know, we live in a different world from the conventional world, the British imperial world of send a gunboat, we'll sort the problem out. Those days have gone. Let me give you some thoughts. We live in a global economy, we all know that. We have the G7, the G8, the G20, we know even got the G77. Multinational companies, as Dr. Vinyaz talked about this morning. We have rampant ideologies. Uh, communism was a rampant ideology until uh, the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Well, some, some will say Islam is now a rampant ideology. We have supranational organizations, United Nations, OSCE, and the rest. But at the same time, that we have all these global things happening, we have some interesting things happening at the micro level. The sanctity of human life in the West is now overwhelming. Oh my God, somebody got killed. You know, presidents will change direction because Mrs. Smith at number three railway cuttings died. God, this is utterly unacceptable. So we have this huge sensitivity to casualties in the West. And yet in some places, particularly if you go to places like even India, where people die of COVID, or indeed in Africa, uh, there is very little sensitivity to casualties. So you have a huge imbalance. We have lots of personal travel these days, lots of debt, and we also have a world that is much less deferential. So we're in a new world, new loyalties, and new everything else. I don't have to remind you, because uh, Dr. Binyaz talked about this this morning, we, we're in a world where population growth uh, is now huge. I mean, you mentioned 9 billion this morning. I mean, my calculations were actually about seven right now, uh, but you were pretty close to that. Um, but I think we're going to stop at nine, so people say, UN says, if things happen, we will get to nine and we'll plateau. To which my retort is, well, how do you know? Why would it stop at nine? It didn't stop before at 2.3. Why would it stop at nine? And indeed, people have said, and if you look at this graph here, you know, you look at it, it's almost symmetrical. And you could say there are as many people alive now as have ever lived. That's not actually true. But it wouldn't take much to see that if this thing is totally symmetrical and it's sort of battered that way, uh, you would end up with that being true. That's a huge number of people. And when you look at that in terms of the global change, you can end up, as you can see, with major uh, imbalances. So, population is a problem. I'm not going to go into oil just except to show you that the, this is a calculation that was done by a, a group uh, in, well, it's energy files done for the Canadian talking about the fact that there may well be a point where there is maximum oil and there is now a, a runoff. And if you, even if you reduce demand down to the maximum you can reduce demand, there could well be a supply gap. Of course, there probably won't actually be a gap. It's just that the other supplies, the costly supplies, will fill that up. And there's no reason why oil couldn't cost $200 a barrel, $300 a barrel, or even $400 a barrel in order to bridge the gap between demand uh, and supply. So we have that. We have, of course, water as a, as a pretty critical thing. But in addition to that, maybe the way in which conflict is, is taking place has changed as well. We're used to interstate warfare, or maybe civil war at the outside. But actually, are we in, as Rupert Smith would say, war amongst states? That sort of internal, you know, sub-state actors in this state are fighting sub-state actors in another state. Or regimes over here are fighting regimes over there. But the mass of the population really aren't involved too much at all. We have this phenomenon, globalization of comms. Why is that important? Well, it's now meant that we fight wars 24-7. Uh, Prime Minister Blair could sit, uh, as we know, in Gulf War II and actually watch the predator feed. So he could sit there in 
in the, in the office in, in uh, number 10, and he could watch a predator fly around on his TV, and uh, if he wants to, give directions. In fact, in the Kosovo War, uh, in 1999, that is exactly what General Wes Clark, the senior Allied commander of Europe, sitting in his office in Brussels, sat watching the predator feed on the telephone, giving instructions to somebody down in Kosovo, why are those tanks not being taken out? Well, is that what a four-star general is supposed to do? I mean, that's what a corporal is supposed to be doing, taking out tanks. He's supposed to be directing, thinking ahead. But the globalization of comms has given him that capability. And so you now have people who meddle down right at the lowest possible level. We have this, this phenomenon of asymmetry. Now, people think that well, asymmetry is something new. But, of course, the thing about asymmetry is it's always been there. I mean, I showed that with the, the chariot. You know, when the chariots come into view for the first time from the infantry, there's a huge asymmetry. So we think that this is something new. But what it does mean is this, that whereas in the past we thought we understood conflict, now we're in a situation where we try and deter everything we possibly can. I don't know, we don't want um, Rwanda to invade Chad, not that anything's ever likely to happen, but we don't want that to happen, so we'll think about that and think how we can possibly make sure that it never happens. So we will buy the weapons, we will buy the goodwill, we'll do whatever we need to do to make sure that can't happen. So when you're the enemy, if you live in Rwanda, and you know already that major activity has taken place to stop you invading Chad, well, how are you going to do it? You're not going to do it the way that the people have anticipated. Because if you do that, you're a real fool. You've done exactly what they expected. You must do something they don't expect. Well, what's the effects of that is this. They're always going to surprise you, because that's the only way to work. Because if you do the straightforward frontal assault, just like battles of the past, and you're going to get a very bloody nose unless you have overwhelming capability. But given the fact that there's this huge asymmetry, you don't have an overwhelming <laughs> capability. All you're going to do is make yourself look at fool. So we're all into this sort of game. And then when we come on to the fact that while the West may be playing one particular game, it may well be that other people are playing a completely <coughs> different game. And it's very, very difficult then to try and work out what game they're playing. But here's the, the big bugbear as far as the West is concerned, and indeed any, any states these days, um, we congratulate ourselves on having huge amounts of power. God, we could blow the world apart 20 times over with nuclear weapons. Maybe destroy the world tomorrow. But can we use it? No. So we have the power, conventionally and nuclear, but there's a problem. There's this mesh, there's this like, sort of thing which stops us using our power. Things like legal restrictions. Legitimacy. How will our publics react to them? What about straightforward political weakness? So given the fact that you've got 50 divisions, what actually comes out the other end in terms of what the enemy gets is one man and a dog and perhaps a Land Rover if you're lucky. Virtually nothing. But of course, on the other hand, this chap, the enemy, whoever he may be, he doesn't have much power in the first place, but by God, this is the difference. He doesn't have much of a constraints mesh. He can do whatever he likes at any time. Who the heck gives a, gives a damn? So there's no mesh that stops him. Legitimacy, who cares? He says, you know, might is right. I do what I can get away with, because that will justify what I've done. But at the same time, for the reasons I've mentioned, we have this huge assumed vulnerability. Oh my God, Mrs. Smith died. This is the end of the world. So we end up in a position where, although hugely powerful, we are almost impotent because of our own restraints and concerns. And yet at the same time, the person who has virtually no power, he's got one gun and a couple of bullets, he could shoot somebody, and we'll all jump to obey, jump to do whatever he wants. So we end up in a, in a situation knowing that we have asymmetry in power, but a, a, a vulnerability in terms of uh, the asymmetry of vulnerability. So given this sort of complicated, complex world, we have to ask ourselves what people are playing at. And it's not until you ask yourself these questions that you can fully understand quite what is going on. I mean, what's this chap playing at? Now, I believe you just sort of think about that for a second. I mean, uh, those of us that have seen Team America will recall uh, him and Hans Blix. Um, uh, you know, there was a sort of continuous competition between Kim Jong-il and Hans Blix. But I mean, what is he actually doing? Is he there to try and establish himself as a regional superpower? Is he actually trying to just cement his own family's grip on power? Or are there much more subtle and less controversial results that one needs to take into account? One has to ask as well what this particular gentleman is doing. And no doubt that a good doctor here will tell us what he's doing. Um, 
I mean, is he, does he really want to exterminate Israel? Hmm, I don't know, does he? Or is actually his intention to cement his, his control of, of Iran and the way that we've seen and the problems that we have with the election? Or is it going to be a new Persian Empire, tax takeover of Iraq, as, uh, as we, the doctor mentioned earlier? But whatever it is, we don't seem to be getting the message. I'll come back to that in a second. We don't understand what Iran's peaceful message is. You know, and you can see the jokes like this, you know, there's a nuclear bomb and an electric light bulb. Really, it's for peaceful domestic uses. And then we have Mohammed el Baradar looking very awkward, looking very worried. So what is going on? You need to ask ourselves the questions. What sort of power play is being used here? And let's not forget that if I come back to our good friend, Mr. Ahmadinejad, this particular gentleman here, and I don't know if a good doctor will know who they are, because I think we mentioned them in a card, remember? This is Hassan. He is the, the leader of the assassins, who later became the Ismaili sect. And if I just describe to you, um, this is how Marco Polo described the Ismaili sect, or this particular sect. This man, uh, Hassan, um, he was uh, a regional warlord uh, with a small number of castles in the north, northern part of Persia. And he wanted to become a, a great big regional power. So he had all these aspirations, but of course he didn't have enough troops to be able to do anything with it. And uh, so he thought, well, what I will do in my castle of Alamut, and this is supposedly Alamut, um, I will create, well, you can't really see it, but there is supposedly a garden of earthly delights. <coughs> in the garden of earthly delights was everything a man could possibly want. Wine, women, and song, as much as you could possibly imagine. And his methodology, and this is Hassan's methodology, was to get a young man from the local village, fill him full of hashish, take him into the top of the castle of Alamut, while he was out for the count of hashish, and while he was there, he would wake up, he would then have whatever fun and games that he wanted, and then a couple of days later, Hassan would appear to see this young man himself, and say, my son, we are in paradise together. And when the young man acknowledged that, he was filled full of hashish again, out of the garden of earthly delights, back down to the bottom of the hill. Whereupon Hassan came up to him again and said, my son, yesterday we were together in paradise. If you wish to return to paradise, this is what you must do. Take this dagger and go to Baghdad and stab the caliph through the heart three times. Well, of course, the young man, my God, you're not been to paradise, it's pretty good, I'm, I'm in for this. So off he goes to Baghdad, and of course he doesn't get away with it, you know, somebody kills him as he comes up the first, first obstacle. <coughs> but if enough people are sort of go through this process, eventually somebody somebody arrives at the caves divan and kills the caves. Fine. Whereupon Hassan then sends a letter and it reads, Dear new caliph, I was awfully sorry to hear what happened uh, to your previous uh, incumbent. Um, I, you can rest assured of my absolute support. I wonder if you'd like to help me with a few problems I have. And it doesn't take the new caliph long to get used to the idea that, of course, if he doesn't come up with the answers or do what Hassan wants, uh, of course, he is going to be the next one to have a knife stabbed through his heart. Now, modern scholars have poured scorn on the fact that there was this garden of earthly delights, but it is clear that this group of people did use uh, assassination as a method of war, it's also clear that they were high on drugs, hashish mostly, and the modern word assassin comes directly from the word hash-hashing, which is what these people were deemed to have been part of. So they were hash hashings And indeed, they were successful until 1256. And unfortunately for them, in 1256, the Mongols turned up, uh, the con the, all the castles were captured, all the people that were in the castles were murdered, and the problem just went away. But for a time, that method of warfare that terror at the highest level was extremely effective. So that sort of sets the scene. Let's bring it right up to date and ask ourselves then what all this was about. Well, what was it about? Is it retribution for some imagined slight? Is it punishment to the West because you need to be punished, you've done, you haven't done what we've said? Or is it actually a persuasion to make us do what we, what Osama bin Laden would like us to do? Well, you'll remember this chap, and I gave you these two comments earlier. War is an act of human in intercourse. It's an act of force to compel our enemy to do our will. And you'll remember that, of course, war is also politics by other means. So the whole lot is wrapped up together. And let's just talk a little bit about how you use this thing called force. Well, we've seen how power is used. 
Uh, Louise de Kerouac used her power in one particular way, by crying at the appropriate moment and being flexible at other moments. She had power, uh, and of course we've also seen how the assassins managed to use their power. But let's try and break it down a little bit. Well, I don't know if I can change it. Okay. Force really has these two components, and the components are denial and coercion. Now let me just talk through those for a second. Let's look at the denial. This is all about the ability to use force in a physical sense. And you can use force to constrain or destroy. Let's say we, an enemy has an army of 10,000 people. I can go along and put a nuclear weapon on them, and guess what? They're all dead. I have now destroyed them. The problem has gone away. I have destroyed them. Alternatively, I can find they've still got 10,000 people. I didn't drop a nuclear weapon, but they got across a river. So what I do then, essentially I knock down all the bridges so they can't get across. So I have denied the enemy the opportunity to use its force to come against me. I have denied him the opportunity. So I've either destroyed him, or I've constrained him. Or I can cover him in liquid, or whatever it is, and stop him from moving you know, these sort of clever new uh, non-lethal weapons. But I've stopped him from doing whatever it was. That does not include any form of psychological warfare. It's purely physical. So that's it. What about the coercive side, the psychological side? Let's just think a little bit more about that for a second. What are the options that really come out? So if I've got all this force, I want to coerce him. Now, what sort of things can I do? Well, let's go back to Saddam Hussein and, and Kuwait. So in 1990, the autumn of 1990, Saddam Hussein is in Kuwait, and we could have said to him, Dear Saddam Hussein, if you don't get out of Kuwait by Christmas, we're going to nuke Baghdad. That would be a threat. Now, whether he believed it or not, that's, that's uh, here or there, but that would be a threat. Or if you don't get out of Kuwait by Christmas, we're going to invade, blah, blah, blah. But you're saying, unless you do something, I'm going to do something that you won't like. So that's one option. The next one you can do is just hurt somebody. And that really is reflected uh, by Demosthenes and the Periclean strategy. If you invade Athens or invade Attica, uh, I will go round the corner and and kick the hell out of Pilos, or I'll go to, I don't know, wherever it might be, Sparta itself, perhaps. And I will cause all sorts of hurt and damage in the middle of Sparta that make it not profitable for you to do. And I'll keep doing it every time you do, you invade Attica. So you just hurt them. And the final option that you have is to punish somebody. But of course, the trouble with punishment, if it's not done with the idea of making them conform, I mean, all you're really doing is just motivating yourself, building your own population up to make them feel happier. You know, they invaded Kuwait, so let's punish somebody else. You know, who is it who actually caused it in the first place? You know, we'll, we'll punish them, and that will make us feel better about the whole thing. So we're maybe doing it as an act of revenge, even. You know, you've done something I don't like. This is our chance to get revenge in. But at the same time, maybe it's a deterrence for the future. So that's the sort of element that you have in terms of that. But that, of course, is all psychological. So we can use force, as you can see, in a denial, a physical sense, or in a psychological sense. But the truth of the matter is that, of course, even as you go down the physical side, there's always a, a coercive payoff. Always a coercive payoff. And the closer you get to actually destroying somebody, the closer you get to persuading them that it's a good time to surrender. <coughs> but let's just think for a second. I've talked about force. What are the other instruments of power we could perhaps apply? Well, I don't know if I can get this to work. No? Let's just think of sanctions. South Africa, uh, when it had the apartheid regime, we can go a denial type of thing. We can destroy the, the crops or we can constrain them so that they can't physically have baked beans or weapons or whatever it is you don't want them to have. But what you're hoping for is that will then produce a coercive type of strategy that will make them then give in. But nevertheless, you do it in the physical sense in order to hopefully have some sort of coercive payoff. What about some other things? Whoops, hang on. Diplomacy. You can do the same sort of thing diplomatically, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but you can try and prevent them from getting friends and keeping them isolated in order to have some sort of coercive payback so that they conform to what it is you want to do. Then, of course, we come on to this one, cyber IT. We can take out their banking. We can take out all their money supply. We can go to Milosevic's account and take his money away. We can go to his uncle's account and take his money away. And ultimately, of course, He's been denied the ability to use his money in order to make him do what it is he wanted to do. And then, of course, we come on to the, the final one, which is never far from uh, anybody's minds. And as many husbands will know, 
there is, of course, a denial aspect to sex, which produces a coercive outcome. Everybody's being ultra sensitive about that. Probably that's not politically correct to say things like that. <coughs> but then, so we talked about the ways in which you can use power. Let's now talk about what we mean by the semantics of power. And you'll probably know a chap called Joseph Nye talked about soft power and hard power. Now, most people think of soft power being carrots, but actually he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about soft power being the sort of the context. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, many parts of the world will drink Coca-Cola, eat hamburgers, and walk around wearing jeans, and that is the soft power, and they think it's really great to do these sorts of things. It doesn't necessarily mean they will do what you want in terms of foreign policy and the ways in which you wish them to behave. But when you come on to the hard power, the carrots and the sticks, it's the combination of these two together that actually often produce the sort of outcome that you are after. So let's concentrate now on this area, because this is the background, and this is the methods by which you're going to try and persuade or, 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 or um, coerce somebody into doing something. So let's talk about coercion. And conventionally, coercion has been typified as having deterrence and compellence aspects. And I want to just talk about deterrence and compellence uh, separately. I'm grateful to a chap and friend of mine, John Harvey, who, who wrote this particular thing on deterrence. But I think it's uh, nevertheless a good starting position for what I'm going to talk about, which is the more coercive aspects. We tend to think of deterrence as meaning this. You know, you recall initially when the nuclear weapon was first uh, produced, um, of course, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and indeed there may well have been a third one. Um, but of course, there was a huge asymmetry. It was designed with the nuclear weapons designed in order to persuade the Soviet Union not to do this, this, and this, and take over the rest of the rest of Europe. So there was a nuclear theology that developed. Then, when they got a when they got a nuclear weapon, then we had a form of balance, mutually assured destruction. You remember MAD, mutually assured destruction, was the watchword for the 80s, 70s, and 80s because both sides could destroy the other with nuclear weapons. So you have a sort of balance. But that's, I mean, that's great, great theological stuff, but that's not really what I want to talk about here. This is a form of deterrence. You know, World War I was the war to end all wars. There was never, ever going to be another World War I. And for many, it was believed. This would never be allowed to happen again. It deterred a number of states from even contemplating war. The Germans, on the other hand, thought themselves aggrieved because they had been stabbed in the back. And they were determined to readjust the balance. But for the West, particularly the Allies, they ended up in a situation where they deterred themselves. And so you end up in a situation where the Germans were less deterred because they had an agreement, and they were prepared, if necessary, to go back and do this again. Whereas the West was saying, never again will we allow that to happen. So now you have a huge asymmetry in power, because the Germans are prepared to hazard everything, and the West are going, oh, no chance. And indeed, I saw there was a, a thing on TV last night, TV sank, I don't know if anyone else saw it, uh, uh, talking about what happened when the Germans invaded Poland. Uh, it was news to me until a few years ago that the French actually marched forward. As the Germans punched into Poland, the French said, we will support our Polish allies, and we will invade Germany and they marched right up to the Siegfried Line. That was a total distance of eight kilometers, and they never went any further, because they could not bear the thought of what might happen next. And had they punched on and continued punching on, there's at least some chance Hitler would have had to bring divisions back from Poland, and probably he would have stopped whatever he was doing. So self-deterrence played a huge role in making us into a weakness, into, into a weak situation. But what do we mean by deterrence? Well, this, this is the classical sense. State of mind brought by a threat of retaliation. Whatever you plan cannot succeed. The costs will exceed any gain. Failure of costs and the consequences. I mean, that's a very logical statement. You can imagine somebody sitting down and drafting that out and saying, this, this is what deterrence is really all about. But the problem with that sort of methodology is that it almost completely ignores the psychology. And it assumes that one is going to be entirely rational with the whole, whole situation. You assume rationality. He's going to look at the expected costs and the benefits of all con alternative courses of action and you make a logical choice. 
So Salim was saying, thinking about whether to evade Q8, what's in it for me and what are the downsides? You know, you produce a balance sheet. Okay, on the good side, I'll get the Romila oil field, I'll get Bobby Yan and Warbeck, and I'll take Q8 out of the equation. What are the downsides? Well, according to April Glasby, nothing at all. She said it was okay. Off you go, easy. But of course, it doesn't quite work like that. It's not quite as simple as that. You can't just do it as a mathematical equation. And the problem is that rational actor theories don't really work in this particular area. Uh, go back to the Falkland Islands in 1982. Same sort of thought process would have gone through. Oh my goodness me, can we take the Falklands? What should we do about taking them? Malvinas, as they call them. Um, is there a deterrent posture? And of course, these things become far more built up in terms of what the Junta thought in Buenos Aires and why they need to attack the Falklands rather than a straightforward cost-benefit analysis. But let's say that somebody does uh, decide to set up a deterrent posture and that deterrent posture then fails. Let's say, for example, taking the Falklands as an example, we've sent a company of Marines down to the Falklands and then the Argentinians have still invaded. So our deterrence posture has not worked. What then do we need to do? Well, the answer is we now need to think about coercion options. And of course, once deterrence has failed, whoops, let's get there. It's, uh, hang on, hang on. I've got a slight problem here. Once deterrence fails, then we have, end up in a situation where things have changed. And it's really this way. When you set up a deterrent posture, the choice is with the person who is actually starting the, 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 the campaign. So Saddam was saying, is being deterred from invading Q8, but once he invades Q8, now the choice passes to you, the assailant, the person who has decided what to do with it. And you've got to decide what will be necessary to get back to where you were before. And it's pretty clear that if you put a company of Marines in the Falklands, and that did not deter the Argentinians, putting another company of Marines is hardly going to kick them out. So whatever you do now has got to be much, much bigger and stronger and harder than the first action that you took to deter him. So now everything comes to you. You now have the choice, oh my god, what shall I do? And you now have to come up with a force level or the coercive uh, methodology that will be strong enough to achieve what it is you want uh, to, to work. But of course now the problem is that there may be a cost asymmetry. So again, going back to Kuwait or indeed the Falklands, once you've got position, possession of that particular new land, what are you prepared to do now in order to retain it? And quite often that's where the asymmetry is. The person who's gained something will do an awful lot to keep it, rather than the person who only had a lukewarm feeling about it in the first place. So let's uh, see what you should do when you're going to go now for your, your, your coercive action. And conventionally, and it is purely conventionally, the targets of your coercive force, whatever it might be, uh, Louise de Kerouai or you know, your military option or nuclear weapon or whoever you're going to use falls into one of these three categories. So you could either attack the leadership or the population or the armed forces. Now you can come up with your own list. I mean there, are, there may be a regional chieftain that um, you know, happens to sit down here somewhere who's separate from the armed forces and maybe this is the guy you need to attack. And indeed, uh, as you probably know, on the opening night of Gulf War II, um, an attempt was made to kill Saddam Hussein at the Dora Farms. Uh, intelligence was received that, the Dora, that Saddam Hussein was at the Dora Farms. Uh, I think it was a B-1 uh, bomber, which was overhead Baghdad at the time, was vectored in to put a bomb on the Dora Farms. It did so within 20 minutes of, of the decision being taken. Unfortunately, Saddam Hussein had just left. Now, that would have been coercively a great victory because those that were left, the, the, the remainder of the Republican um, what was it, Council, would probably have said, well, we don't want to continue with this. Let's, let's give up. Let's, let's find a way out of this. So it may well be that that would, not have been, that would have been a very lucrative target, not on this particular list. But eventually, leadership, population, or armed forces. Now, let me just try and be a bit more specific about this. Let's think about Hiroshima, the end of World War II. So what did Hiroshima target? Well, OK, so we're going to use that coercive force. Hiroshima, wrong. We're not targeting the population. The people in Hiroshima are dead. 60,000 people died in Hiroshima, and unfortunately they had to do the dying so that the pressure could be applied there. That's the target, not the people that had to do the dying. If we then look at what happened in Kuwait, who was the target? Well, in that case, 
It was the armed forces, and it really was the armed forces, because once they had given up, it didn't matter what Saddam Hussein thought about the situation, his army had run away. We had regained Kuwait. So you have to try and be very selective in who you target, because if you get the wrong one, take World War II. We, as you probably recall, in World War II, did a strategic bomber campaign, supposedly against the population. Did it work? Well, in some senses it probably did, because it certainly demotivated the German population. But did it actually cause the end of the war? Well, no, the answer is it didn't, because the Gestapo were making sure that it jolly well didn't. So we need to think in terms of not only your coercive force and who you target, but also in terms of the counter-coercive force. So the question you have to ask yourself is this one. Who is the power broker? Who's the man that can influence what is going to happen? Who's the person you're going to go after? And don't forget, he's not the person that's going to die. This is the decision maker. The people that die are the people who are going to influence him to make the right decision. And that is really the question that comes through next. What destruction or what sort of pressure are you going to put on this man in order to get him to change his decision? Change his mind. Do whatever you like. But let's look at uh, Kosovo for a, a, an example. So let's, let's take this one. The Kosovo campaign of 1999, uh, you'll recall, it lasted the air campaign, there was no ground campaign, lasted 78 days, quite a long time. Pretty similar in, in real terms to what happened in Gulf War I. Uh, 38,000 sorties, air sorties were flown, uh, of which 10,000 were attack sorties. That seems like quite a lot until you recall, what did I say, the number of attack sorties flown on the first day of D-Day, or on D-Day. On D-Day, we flew 14,000 attack sorties, and this is 10,000 attack sorties over 70 days. So you can see it's not even anywhere like uh, the original attack. So what do, we, what do we actually think that we're doing? Well, this is what Sakur thought we were doing. So Sakur, senior ally commander of Europe, sits at NATO, and he directs that we will attack the armed forces in the field, and by attacking the armed forces in the field, Milosevic will give up, and that will be the end of the problem. But that actually didn't work too well, because General Mike Short, who was the air component commander, who was sitting down at uh, Aviano Air Base, El Vicenza, down in northern Italy, his view was that actually you need to attack the leadership directly. And so his campaign was to go directly for the heart of the leadership in Serbia and take out all the devices that supported Milosevic, the factories that he owned, his cousin's factories, the banking that he owned, you know, blah, 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 this great long target set. But nevertheless, by attacking both of those, the effect was that Milosevic was persuaded. As it turned out, the attack on the armed forces probably didn't produce much effect at all. And the real thing that caused Milosevic to give in was the bombing directed against Serbia, its infrastructure, and everything else. So the question is, that why was it that Milosevic capitulated? Well, what was it then? Was it NATO air power? Okay, maybe. Was it the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia? Because they told Milosevic he was up, up for the hijack. Was it the Russian factor? You'll probably remember that uh, Atisari and Chernomurdin went to see uh, Milosevic, I think it was twice during the course of the campaign, and that the last time they made it absolutely clear to him that the Russians were not, like the 7th Cavalry, going to come over the hill and get him off the hook. You are, Mr. Milosevic, by yourself, you will be by yourself, you've got yourself into this bloody muddle, now get yourself out of it, there is no other help. Was it that? Or was it the threat of the land operations that were sitting on the border? Well, the answer, actually, is actually very simple. It's all of the above. Because he is a person, and these pressures are bearing down on him. And you come through to uh, what I've uh, sort of uh, described as the suicide theory of coercion. And that is, as you, well, I mean, I don't know how many of you have actually considered suicide, but I'm sure somebody here has actually considered suicide. But the thing that drop, drives you over the edge to actually fire the bullet or cut your wrist or whatever it is you're going to do is not the most important thing. You know, the dog has died, the money has all gone, my wife has left me, the house has fallen apart. Oh my God, it's all terrible. You go into a bit of a stew and then suddenly, I don't know, the light bulb fails. Ah, oh, that's it, I've had it. And you commit suicide because the light bulb failed. No, of course you don't. You commit suicide because they all bear upon you. They add up, they accumulate. And it's just the, the final thing that makes you finally go. And almost certainly, because he's a person, you know, there's this huge air power, there's this, and it's all coming together. And he finds himself in a situation that he, he can't get himself out of. So that's 
perhaps why Milosevic capitulated. So what did, he, what did he do, though, as a sort of counter to try and, uh, try and offset this? Well, as you'll recall, I mean, what he actually did was he tried to uh, convince the West that uh, you know, this was not a battle that should be prosecuted. So what did he do? Ethnic cleansing, raping of women and children, genocide of women and children, mass deportations. So the West, instead of going along to the leadership saying, oh my goodness me, let's stop doing this, it's terrible. Actually, they said, no, oh, this regain the soldiers. Let's get this bloke because he's nasty. So it doesn't say much for his research and his consideration. I mean, what he wanted to do was to appear a victim. Oh my God, this is poor old Milosevic. They're bombing my armed forces. They're attacking me directly. All I've done is nothing wrong. You know, it's all your fault. Well, that was the message he tried to get across. But doing a bit of rape and genocide and deportations and ethnic cleansing did not help his case. So arguably, he shot himself in the foot. And that, of course, then self-recreates the situation. Let's have a look uh, in general terms, though, about uh, oh, oh, Afghanistan. Let me just mention this. This is, this is the current situation in Afghanistan. I'll just let you read that for a second. I'll a quick glance of copy. What are we trying to do in Afghanistan? And I think when you start to look at it in these sort of senses, it becomes to, makes a little bit more, more sense. ISAF. Well, we could attack the leadership, and that's presumably the Taliban leadership, the population. Is there a population attack or the armed insurgents? Well, what we're actually doing, of course, is trying to take out the armed insurgents in order to create a situation so that the population feels secure. That is what ISAF is trying to do. So that the population, in turn, will then go to their leadership and say, we feel secure, there isn't a problem. So that is the coercive tactic to make the population feel secure, which is why General Stanley McChrystal has realised that he can actually go to the population and tell them they're being secure, give them money and make them feel happy and contented. There's a two-pronged attack. And that way you will eventually get to the situation where the population will feel happy. What are the Taliban doing on the other hand? Well, of course, they're trying to do a different thing entirely. They're going to the Western population. This is not their own population. They're trying to impose civilian casualties and military casualties through the media. And, of course, these people are the agents of the Taliban. That's essentially what is happening. And the Taliban are very happy about that. You know, they have a free propaganda device. It's called the Daily Mail and the Daily Sun and, you know, blah, 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 even the BBC. So they are using the media to get the message across to the Western population. Because if the Western population say, that's it, we've had this, they'll go to the leadership and say, let's get out of Afghanistan. Who does the dying? Well, the people, these people don't do the dying. They don't do the dying. It's these people that do the dying. But they're not the target. These are the target. That's the route they're trying to take. Make the Western population give up so the leadership will get out of Afghanistan, get us out of Afghanistan. And it is actually as simple as, as that. Unfortunately, until we appreciate this and start taking action, which McChrystal is starting to do, we're never ever going to uh, achieve the success. But let me uh, try uh, and go through and tell you some idea of sort of success rates. And I, and I can't go through all these campaigns, although we could if you wanted to. Leadership campaigns, you know, World War II versus the Japanese, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, failures. Uh, leadership campaign, US against the Vietnamese leadership, didn't work. World War II in Europe, that failed. And then come on to population attacks. Well, Vietnam versus the USA population, that was a success. The Vietnamese coerced the United States population, and they essentially persuaded the leadership to give up in Vietnam and get the troops home. So that was a coercive success. Failures, you'd see that. But here we are, Taliban versus the Western public. And you see I put it sort of hovering between the two. But if you understand that is the population uh, aspect, then we can have some sort of uh, meaningful discussion about it. Armed forces, well, generally been pretty successful coercive attacks against the armed forces, largely because there's quite a lot of denial in this. Uh, and so these can be uh, normally more successful, even on a denial sense. Failures, US versus the Vietnamese, uh, arguably as a failure. But if you then put them all together and try and, uh, and work it out, uh, leadership, yeah, that can work pretty well. Population, very difficult to say. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Armed forces, for the reasons that I said quite often, does work, if you understand what you're doing. But when you apply this carrots and sticks coercive force, what should you use then in order to generate the sort of outcomes that you're after? Well, if you're going to bomb them, then that's great, because you impose pain, and once you bomb them, that's pretty good, and it indicates resolve. Uh, the sinking of the Belgrano in 1982, 
demonstrated to the Argentinians, to the Americans, and to the British people that this was for real. We'll sink the Belgrano, there's no doubt anymore, this is now going to happen. So it's like sort of nailing your colours to the mast. Um, pain, the great thing about pain is actually if you bomb them, and then bomb them tomorrow, and then bomb them the next day, it all starts to add up, a bit like the suicide case. It accumulates as time goes by, and it sort of often escalates as time passes as well. It's very difficult to habituate to pain. I remember when I was a schoolboy, I used to get beaten. And I have to tell you that being beaten the second time was in some ways worse than being beaten the first time. And when you were beaten the third time, you probably didn't want it to happen too much again. So it tends to build up. But what it does do is it builds resentment. So you think, so and so, you know, I dislike you intensely. And so if you're going to use pain as the only method, force as the only method, there's a good chance that you're going to build up resentment. This is what happened to Germany in between the wars. The end of World War I, the Versailles Settlement. They had used all these things on me. And Germany, let's not forget, Germany was not defeated in the field. The army was still in being. They never signed an instrument of surrender. And of course, this is a whole part of the business. Lots of pain, lots of coercion. They finally agreed to stop, have an armistice, but the resentment was there. How about reward? Well, uh, reward is often a one-off. If I give you money, I'll give you, I don't know, a million pounds. Am I going to give you a million pounds today and then a million pounds tomorrow, or just is it a one-off? And once you've got the million pounds, what do you then do? I mean, you put it in your pocket and do you do what you've been asked to do? Or do you just say, oh, thanks very much, that's very nice. So perhaps it's only a one-off. <coughs> once you've got it, uh, it has little coercive effect. I remember one very senior officer, and I won't tell you who it was, telling me that he, he, was, um, he couldn't wait to be knighted. You know, he, he, the whole of his life he wanted to be knighted. And finally he was knighted. But once, of course, he got it, it was of zero value, because he now was a knight. It's a bit like getting your doctorate. I can't wait till I get my doctorate. Now I'm a doctor. But once you are a doctor, you're a doctor, so what the hell? It becomes the new, new, new norm. And the trouble with uh, giving a reward is that quite often it creates an expectation that you're going to get something more next time round. So if you give someone a lot of money, uh, and in order to get you to continue to, uh, to, to conform and to be compliant, you're going to have to give them even more money the next time round. <coughs> well, of course, if you're going to use force in the classic ways of using coercion, you better consider some other things first before you go in and bomb them. What do your populations think about? Some people don't have to worry about that, but others do. What about uh, third-party reaction? What might the Russian reaction be? Might they suddenly produce 16th shock army and come drive it straight into Kosovo? So you better understand that as well. But the first step, if you're going to use this thing, is to establish your credibility and demonstrate its impotence. Which is why air superiority over the area is such a fundamental thing. Because having established air superiority, having established your dominance, it then is perfectly clear to the person you are persuading that you have all the cards in your hand and he has none of the cards in his hand. So we've done all this. We've demonstrated that we've got the resolve. We've demonstrated our input, that he's impotent, he can't do anything about it, and we've demonstrated to him that we have all the cards. But then you're coming through to this idea of what does credibility mean? Well, it's something to do with your resolve and your capability. If I wanted to... I don't know, coerce the Argentinians to get out of the Falklands. I could say things like, if you don't do such and such, I'm going to bring my massive fleet, and I'm going to do this, this, and this. Now, do they believe me, or don't they believe me? That's the question you have to judge. And you can measure capability, of course, but the problem is you can't always measure resolve. This is an interesting thing. This is uh, even the Kosovo War, Wes Clark, Sankula, we're going to attack, disrupt, degrade, devastate, blah, 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 destroy. Looks very good. Looks very, very good. If you were sitting in, in Belgrade and you heard these words, you might think, hmm, this is not going, this is not particularly what I want to hear. This is, I mean, diplomatic niceties may be more appropriate, but I didn't want to hear this. But then, of course, they would think about it and think, well, okay, can he really achieve this? And then you come on to this. It's only the target's perception that counts. You may have lots of credibility and lots of resolve and lots of capability, but if they don't believe you, then you're going to get nowhere. So let's just uh, bring us all the way through to the reactions that you get to coercion. This comes down basically to this thing, psychology and the stress versus time. 
If I, um, you, uh, many of you will see a graph like this. If I increase stress on an individual, then actually his performance will rise, and then eventually after he's maxed out and he can't perform anymore, his performance will then start to drop off. I'm sure you've all seen that sort of graph in the past. What you won't have thought about is what happens if the stress is put on too quickly. If I open the door and brought a lion in here, I would get some very interesting reactions. People go, oh my god, I didn't expect the lion to come in. Some of you jump out of the door. Others will fall in the corner and cry for mum. And some will say, right, I'm really strong and try and take the lion on. But the stress factors would go, and you would do all sorts of things which would be very zoological, probably very irrational. So that tends to be the sort of reaction you get also to bombing, this irrationality, this sudden reaction. But conversely, if I were to apply the stress over a much longer time, you can tolerate much higher levels of stress, and the fall-off is much less rapid. Well, this is sort of like bombing, and this is quite often what happens in terrorism. So for a state to react in this way, that's the sort of way in which it quite often works. So it becomes important when you're trying to look at this, what is the gradient of this application and what is the intensity that's actually applied uh, to a country? And if we uh, then try and work out what might happen in the future, that is, of course, what people do, is they try and think, well, here I am now, what's likely to happen uh, as time goes by? If I uh, then tell them that I'm going to do something and I start to apply uh, a coercive effect, um, then you can start to see that as this is a state that, let's say, has gone to war, so as the, the, the build-up to war has happened, the war has then taken place, and the war has then, then finished. What are the state's performance do? Well, as the war started, they built up, built up, and then they won. Gosh, so the performance stays high for a long time. Then there's a lot of euphoria, the stress comes off, everybody has a good time, and you've now won the battle, so that looks jolly good. What happens, on the other hand, if it's gone the other way and you're actually losing the battle? Well, the war's still going to come, the stress is still building up, but now, guess what? We're starting to lose the battle. So what happens to the state's performance? Well, the state performance rises initially, but now as it all goes pear-shaped, it drops off and eventually comes back to a very low level. And then finally, of course, it'll pick up as, as, as peace then comes. So you end up in a performance reaching a peak and then falling off. This is largely what happened to Germany in sort of 44, 45. Performance of that state was dropping, dropping, dropping all the time. And although the final defeat actually came on the 8th of May, by this stage down here, it was already pretty clear that it was going to be defeated. Well, let me, in fact, I'll leave this one. Let me just finish that. So, as far as the victim is concerned, it's important that we do the things that I've got down here. We must create an impression in the mind of the person you're uh, controlling that he is incapable of controlling the outcome of events. So whatever you're going to do to him, you must make it pretty hard, but still there's more in your quiver. You haven't run out of options, but yet you must know what he expected and then go well above his expectations. So how will you do that? Well, let's just talk about concentration of pressures. There are all sorts of weapons in your arsenal if you are a state, and I've mentioned a few of them, and let's see if I can bring them on and uh, talk to them. Diplomatic. Isolated diplomatically, apply a diplomatic offensive with the denial and coercive aspects that I have mentioned. Economic, apply sanctions. They don't tend to work all the time, as South Africa proved, because rulers can export shortages and they can find means of overcoming them. And indeed, Saddam Hussein, you recall, we denied him uh, weapons and we also gave him lots and lots uh, of uh, medicines for his children. All he did was take all the medicines, put them into a, a lockup so that nobody got access to them, and then handed them out as if they were his own, in order to make it seem that he was the man who was the, uh, the great uh, giver of, of good things. But uh, economic uh, things can work, depending on what offers leverage. And of course, this is Russia uh, trying to use um, oil imports against U Ukraine. Military, I, I won't say too much about because I think we've, we've gone through that, but um, so I shall leave that. But let's think of some other ones. Cyber. Physically, you could take down his IT. You could destroy his bank account. You could take out his cash from his bank accounts, particularly those that were in Switzerland. But of course, in doing the cyber physical activities, you're also going to have psychological activities as well. Put viruses into his system. Make his systems run slow so everything takes longer. So none of his cash dispensers work. Cause a crash or threaten to cause a crash, and then finally take cash uh, away from him so that he can't actually do anything. 
And I could go through these, and I'm not going to go through them uh, in too much detail because you could sort of go through these forever. Media offensive would be another option that could be used. Uh, you know, obviously papers. I mean, the other option is to use something like this. Uh, this lady on Al Jazeera. I'm not sure that she presents necessarily the right sort of message for uh, what is uh, trying to be a very serious uh, assessment of what is going on. Um, what sort of things could you do? You could physical aspects, broadcasts, overt info, leaflets. Psychological, use these sorts of things through the media. Can be very, very good. Let's not forget Dr. Joseph Goebbels in World War II, who did virtually all of this lot with a considerable amount of success, not only against the Allies, but also to remotivate his own population. Then we come on to intelligence things. I mean, why is intelligence important? Well, sometimes you want him to know what you're going to do, because it demonstrates your power. I am all-powerful, I will decide. So you can let him know your capabilities and your deployments. But on the other hand, you might want him to guess, you want to deceive him, you want to exaggerate things to make him in some sort of doubt. There are things religious and ideological you could do. Uh, threaten to destroy his mosques. Legislate against. I mean, you could, you could actually do it. This was done, well, I mean, Louise de Carouille. You know, the Catholics in Britain, they were discriminated against. That was, of course, done for particular physical reasons. But, of course, you can use the ideological as a, uh, as a weapon. I mean, not forget, we used to burn people at the stake. Catholics and Protestants. It was very common. People were being burnt at the stake uh, during the Bloody Mary's reign. Gain public opinion, undermine his religious credibility, and all these things can be done. I just show you these because, not because I'm suggesting you do it, indeed, I'm not suggesting you go ahead and do ethnic cleansing, but you need to be aware that these things can be done against you. These are options. And unless you are aware that they can be done, you're going to be wrong footed. Genghis Khan. Tell me, Genghis Khan, how do you get on with your neighbours? Very well, I don't have any neighbours. The reason was he got rid of them. Psychological ethnic cleansing, terrorism, Bosnia in 93, 95, rape as a method of war. And if you think that that is something that is new, I'm sure I don't have to remind you that uh, when Berlin fell, uh, 100,000 rapes were reported from the three days that the Red Army took possession of Berlin. Those were the ones that were reported, 100,000. And indeed, if you go back into history, many armies that have moved into an area rape as an act of war well, for a start, you can increase the number of children of your army, but also, of course, it means that the woman is unclean and probably will no longer recreate again. So when we bring all this lot together, and I think that's over the nuclear, I mean, that's fairly obvious, the nuclear side. When you bring all that together, what I'm suggesting to you, this is the key, that as you start to use these various instruments, their sanctions, the sort of profile of how sanction produces stress against time, diplomacy, so we have a little offensive here, Atisari and, um, and Chernomerdin turn up, and that doesn't work, and they come back later and shout a bit louder. And then we put in some bombing, and that sort of starts a bit later, and then bombing takes place. When you add this lot together, what you're actually after is what I best describe as a synergy. Because as you add up all these things together, you will end up with this sort of peak. And it's this sort of peak, the final yellow peak, that just like a man who is committing or deciding whether to commit suicide, these things are all imploding on you at the same time. And it's not just the one, but it's all of them together that start to produce the effect. And finally, if you do it right, round about here somewhere, he'll say, that's it, I'm out of here. I give in. I do what you want. So that is what is all important about this whole business of coercion, is using the instruments that you've got, and I've discussed several of them, and there are a whole lot more. And you can do them in a way that will actually produce the outcome that you particularly want. But let me remind you of one thing, and that was going back to the psychology lecture, and it's this. That if you do these things at such a level of pressure that you create rage, then the chap will appreciate that he's not going to be able to get away with it. He will then fight you and fight you to the end. So you must give him a way out. Because unless you give him a way out, all you will do is condense in their minds the idea they must fight and fight hard because there's no other way. So there, ladies and gentlemen, the psychology of interstate relations called coercion. And I hope that if you remember nothing, you'll remember that graph, because I think it tells you everything there is to know about the way in which states behave. And they don't just behave towards adversaries. I'm sure it will not have escaped your notice that these things are taking place even between allies. Now, we don't bomb allies, hopefully. We haven't done recently. 
but everything else is being used continuously. So states are being bombarded by coercive pressures, slowly, subtly, but surely. And that way, you know, the West, and you remember Tony Blair, who was considered to be George Bush's poodle, is convinced that he must behave in a way that is compliant towards the United States. Coercive pressures, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. Thank you very much.